Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the show. Today, joining me is the founder at Bro Doe, Erica Rankin. Erica, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. I am excited to have you on. Let's get right into this this name. I I need to know. Well, I guess one, let's explain what the product is, and then two, get right into why Bro Doe because uh, it definitely jumps out. Yeah, totally. And it's kind of ironic because I'm a female founder, right? But yeah, so the product itself, Frodo, is a plant-based protein-infused cookie dough. Uh, we just launched our edible cookie dough bites into the Canadian market. So they are gluten-free, refined sugar-free, natural ingredients, and then have eight to nine grams of protein. So almost like a protein bar, but not totally like a protein bar and doesn't taste like a protein bar. And then we're going to be launching other products soon. Uh, that's kind of in the pipeline. And then I used to be a bro. So I competed in bodybuilding back in 2018. And I used to make this product for myself. And I made it for myself because I couldn't find it in grocery stores. It did not exist. So I manipulated quote unquote unhealthy recipes, made this one. It tasted delicious. It was healthy. I could fit it into my diet. A lot of people loved the product and like my friends and family enjoyed it. And then I decided to package it and sell it and brand it as Brodo. And I'm not really a bro as much anymore, but I'm still very much into um, healthy living and like working out and stuff. Hey, once a bro, always a bro. Coming from, a, <laughs> from someone who definitely was. Yeah. So <laughs> I love it. Uh, it definitely jumps out. And I like the, the ethos of the company. Like, hey, let's make a protein snack that's you know, going to be tasty, You're going to speak to that treat kind of thing. I hey, know this is a treat, but I can still make sure that I'm um, hitting my macros, you know, and helping towards that. So that's, that's awesome. You are in Canada. So I, I'm interested to know how that has been, you know, launching the company out of Toronto, major city, but a lot of times people, they have this urge and they go, I start a company, I got to be in LA, I got to be the New York. And, the, you know, they try to get to some major US hub. You, and not to say Toronto is not a hub, but there, it comes with its own challenges when we come to like packaging, double language, shipping to shipping to the US, getting food across the border. It's an, it's an added layer of complexity. How much of that for you has been, okay, I'm going to launch in Canada. I'm going to focus on the Canadian market first, maybe. Or has it been, I'm going to go, you know, uh, North America wide. How have you thought about it with regards to like market penetration? I think for me, I, you know, I'm, I wasn't, I started the company with like $10,000 out of my car and then out of my apartment and had to be very scrappy and strategic with how I went about growing it. And I focused on D to C for the first two years and, you know, I couldn't sell outside of Canada, given the nature of the product. It's refrigerated. It needed to be express shipped. It's expensive to ship. And I had this problem and I still have this problem, which is a good problem, I guess, in some ways. But I have a brand that's bigger than the business. So majority of my followers on platforms like TikTok and LinkedIn are US based and they can't buy the product. So it's been very frustrating when people want to support me, but they can't just because they can't buy the product. Um, so I guess with my growth strategy is slow, going slow and really dialing in and making sure there's a product market fit here, proving it out here, scaling it here in my backyard, because I do live here. I don't live in the U S and when you start launching into markets that you're not really familiar with, and it's also very competitive. And while it's bigger and there's more opportunity out that way, it's just very different and you need a lot of cash to, to back up your product and to support it, especially as you start flowing into different retailers. So I guess I'm just kind of learning in Canada how it works. Um, and even last year, I had the opportunity to grow into more accounts. I launched into about 100 stores. And um, I had, you know, retailers come and say, Oh, do you want to launch nationally or grow or and I said no to all of those opportunities, just because I wasn't sure if my product was selling on shelf the same way that it was selling online. And lo and behold, it wasn't. So we had to change the pricing, the size, the, you know, make it gluten free, the copy on the packaging, like there were all these problems that I guess holes in our bucket, essentially, that we needed to fix before we further scaled it out. Because when you have massive distribution, and if you go too quickly, and you need to fix things, it's going to be very expensive. And that's oftentimes where you see most companies go under is because, oh, crap, like we launched all these stores on paper, we did 2 million in revenue, but now we're getting delisted because our product's not selling. So 
these are all the things that like people don't understand or founders get like shiny object syndrome and they do too much too soon and they're not ready. And I think saying no is a superpower. And that's like what I've told myself over the past few years. You're spot on, especially in CPG where there's this big pressure to like, and it's like, we're just missing the mark. People are like, I got listed in Whole Foods. That doesn't matter. The goal is to have people buying the product from Whole Foods, like, or to buy, hey, I want to, we're in Toronto. We're going to be in Vancouver. Okay, we're going to go and get in a bunch of Safeways in Vancouver. Okay, we need to have somebody there sampling, supporting, training the staff, making sure that we're doing events, we're in the community, we're actually supporting sales. Because to your point, that rapid expansion can be so costly when you go into a market where you don't have the support or the maybe the demand. And you maybe haven't tightened things up. Like you said, there were holes in the bucket. So you're able to go, oh, before we go through and spend a bunch of money, you know, producing this at scale and then getting delisted and then effectively, you know, burning that bridge. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's make sure that we can own this regionally and then hop or bubble, right? Okay, take this thing from Toronto, take it to Montreal or, mm -hmm. or just keep bubbling. Toronto is so big. And I think the more and more people I have on the show that have companies that are standing the test of time and going through different economic swings, uh, that seems to be the strategy like that they're all taking is very much the uh, slow and steady, you know, iterate, go from there. Now, when it comes to, you know, you're getting into retailers, you're growing in Toronto. How much has that affected DTC? Is DTC still like a big aspect for you or is it pretty split like how how do you see the business as is now and also into the future with regards to those channels everything is completely like flipped so it was a hundred percent d to c for those first like two and a half years and you know i was doing everything myself picking packing shipping fulfilling making the product everything right and I outgrew those operations and then switched to a contract manufacturer. And, you know, coming out of the pandemic, there was that whole D to C wave, right? Everyone was like, you know, my Shopify notifications, I couldn't keep up like the cha-ching. I just woke up and it was going off and I was like, this is great. But, you know, as life kind of resumed back to normal, everyone went into grocery stores and they started buying their products in stores again. And I kind of saw a drop off of sales. So, I thought it probably makes more sense for my product to be on shelf in a store. It's refrigerated. People were complaining about shipping. Shipping costs in Canada have gone up drastically over the past like year and a half, two years. And, um, you know, no one wants to spend $60 on cookie dough that they've never had before. Because if they don't like it, you know, they can't just buy one jar because I will lose money if I try to ship one jar to Vancouver. So I decided to sunset the D2C channel for this product. And focus on retail, try to not do a million different things. Cause I think I was spreading myself too thin last year, trying to do D to C, you know, and then people put in their wrong address or they're at their cottage and they get it delivered to their front doorstep and it spoils. And, you know, there's all those, those things that happen. And when you scale the company and you get more orders, you're going to have more orders that end up like that, right? That you just have to write off as a loss just because of you know, silly situations. And it's really hard scaling a refrigerated product online. So we are launching a shelf stable product that's going to be manufactured in the US. Uh, it's been a very long process trying to get it, you know, right, finalize the formula. But again, I'm trying to go slow and really perfect the packaging and the ingredients and the shelf life and make sure all of that's in check before like releasing it into the market. Um, so that will be something that is accessible to people in the U.S. just so we can monetize on the virality that we've had because our back has been kind of against a wall with the, the product that we have. And I guess I never really understood all of the challenges that a refrigerated product would have. Like if I could go back in time, it would be to have a shelf stable product for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, we had a, a guy on here, Adam Deramo, who does Awake Chocolate. And he said, oh, yeah, they're great. He's yeah. like, I, we learned a painful lesson when we went to Texas and the oh, trucks yeah. weren't cooled. And our first shipment went down there when it was a, a truck full of melted chocolate. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, man. So, yeah, when you go to think about uh, climate and, and refrigeration and how to keep things, you know, from spoiling, can they be shelf stable? What's the shelf life? All mm -hmm. of those things very, very important. Now, kind of thinking about or staying on this, you know, going slow, how do you, 
in a world, the CPG world, which is so, look at me, look how great I am, look at how much we're selling. How do you how do you battle you know those feelings of comparison that maybe come in to founders when they see you know the company down the road that's got in our minds that are forty five steps ahead or they got some account that we hope we could get one day? Do you have anything that you do to kind of like bring you back down to you know okay running your race um, or mm -hmm. things you do to remind yourself? Yeah, I think. I mean, I was really, I really struggled with that at the beginning and I felt like I was doing everything wrong. Like, you know, I was doing deliveries every Friday in my Jeep. I was storing cookie dough on my balcony in the winter because I couldn't afford cold storage, like doing things like that. And then you go on like LinkedIn and you see people like, oh, I raised $10 million. I grew my team to 50 plus people doing all these big things. And I thought that, okay, maybe entrepreneurship isn't cut out for me. But I think the more conversations you have with other founders, you realize it's really hard and nothing is ever as it seems. And just because things might be perceived one way on social media, it's really not the reality of what's going on internally in the company. So even if you are comparing yourself, it's not accurate. And even I've had some people compare themselves to my journey and I'm like, no, that's not the reality. What you think is not the truth. Like this is the truth actually, right? And I think just, you know, remembering that you, like you said, like you're on your own path and doing things like practicing gratitude and journaling. And sometimes on the hard days, I flip back to like an entry from 2021 and I look at where I was and I look at where I'm at now and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. You know, I used to be there and now I'm here and that's, that's huge progress for me. Right. So I think just focusing on what you're doing and what's working for you and try not to get distracted by all the outside noise. You can look to it for inspiration for sure, but not, not comparing yourself for sure too. Right. Yeah. It's that, uh, being inspired, but not negative towards ourselves or not having that negative self-talk to be like that whole thing. Exactly. Oh, I'm, maybe yeah. I'm not good enough to be an entrepreneur. You're stuck. <laughs> or this. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, a lot of those things, the self-talk thing that no, the, the parts that, you know, every entrepreneur has and nobody wants to talk about, but it's so, I like what you said there, like going back to old journal entries and being like, what were my goals two years ago? Whoa, I've actually achieved a lot of those. Okay, cool. Now I can like make my next goal or next mission and run my race. Because to your point, when we see on companies on their Instagram and listen to anyone listening, this is so important. That company that you see on Instagram that you're like, they got it all figured out. I guarantee you they don't. And there's something, <laughs> there's something inside that company that is eating at those founders. It could be anything from finances to a scandal to maybe Jeff from accounting is a bit racist. They have, they're all dealing with their own thing. Um, and I think it's just important to put that in our own minds when we're like, okay, yeah, it, it's okay to be where I'm at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in kind of building off this, you know, you tell your story online, you use TikTok. What, in, what inspired you to say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to document it and kind of tell, you know, kind of be the show all show the whole building in public, as they say. Was that advised to you or you're like, hey, this could be just an unfair advantage that I could use? Like, wh what made you want to do that? It's weird because I went on it. So I, I went on LinkedIn initially um, in 2020 just to find mentorship. Like I needed to find mentors. I needed to learn how to grow my company and take it to the next level because all my friends work for the government. They don't know how to scale a CPG brand. So who's going to help me, right? So I went to LinkedIn and I saw very much a lot of the shiny stuff and no one was posting what it was really like growing a startup, right? The early days and the late nights and the highs and the lows, not just the highs. And I wanted, it's so lame, but I wanted to put all that content out there to like, hopefully help other people and not deter people from pursuing entrepreneurship. Cause it is totally achievable with like minimal resources. And you just like, for example, I used my car to store my product for the first three months in the winter and drove with my heat off because I didn't have money for cold storage. So, you know, like doing things like that, that might seem crazy um, and just showing that this is the reality of what it's like to grow a company and hopefully like inspire or show others like, yeah, this is totally doable. You just have to like, everything is figure outable, right? 
and you know going on facebook marketplace to find someone who's getting rid of moving boxes to use for orders because i don't want to buy cardboard <laughs> like things like that as well um so yeah i just started posting on linkedin and then TikTok as well and um it was also kind of a need for me because i didn't have any money for ads and i remember when i hit publish on my shopify website I didn't know what SEO was. I didn't know what marketing was. I had no idea. I thought that people would just come to me immediately for some reason. And <laughs> when I told my friends and family, I'm like, yeah, the name of the company's Brodo. They Googled it and it wasn't on the first page. It wasn't on the second page, not the third, not the fourth. They couldn't find it. And then I learned, oh crap, I need to figure out how to drive people to my website. And I had a really close friend who did really well on TikTok with her business. And it kind of inspired me to, you know, start putting content out on there. I was very good with Instagram. I was getting good with LinkedIn. And I'm like, okay, TikTok is next. I just need to do it. Because I had a little bit of an ego and pride there and thought that, no, it's just a silly dancing app, you know, like, many CPG founders and many entrepreneurs like didn't want to touch that app because of, I guess, the way that it was perceived. And now people realize the power of the platform. But yeah, I just started posting on there consistently and did it because I had no money for marketing and it ended up working out really well for me. And that was like my main channel of getting reach and generating brand awareness. So yeah, that's awesome. And it, it's one of those things that if you can actually do it and show the authentic journey, mm -hmm. people are going to resonate, you know, they're going to resonate with that. And, uh, and then hopefully it translates to sales, right? That that's the other part of this equation that people, there's no silver bullet if the product's not good. So the product's also got to be good. Right. Yeah. And it, you know, that's awesome that in your case, you're able to kind of have the good product you go through, tell the story and get people to really rally behind you and then go to the site and want to check it out. And get that reach, you know, especially when you don't have capital, massive capital injection for ads. Are you still, are, are you bootstrapped? Do you have investors? What's the, what's the current, you know, landscape like? So I'm still, I'm doing a rolling raise right now. So I have two investors um, doing my seed raise and then I'll probably do a series A next year. So this is just kind of to help support retail expansion because it's it's really expensive and you need a lot of money <laughs> and we're really we're really confident with the product changes that we've made and they're now launching into the market like this month into stores so i just want to scale a little bit quicker now now that we have figured out like fixed the holes in our bucket i guess so to speak and yeah you know listing fees demos trade spend all of that fun stuff you need money for that in order to grow and so that's where this money is going towards Amazing. I love it. Cool. Well, before I let you go, let people know, especially our Canadian listeners, where they can find Brodo um, and then where they should follow you all online. Yeah. So our handles are Eat Brodo on TikTok and Instagram. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, Eric Rinkin. Um, and we're in Ontario stores like Fortino's, Healthy Planet, Sobeys, and going to be expanding into more retail stores across Canada soon. So you can buy it in stores. Awesome. So for all our Toronto listeners, I'm talking to you, Paul. Paul's my roommate from college. Go, 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 go. go. Yeah, Paul, go buy some today. No, Erica, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Shelton. Hit like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll catch you next time.